Hello, and welcome to the Still To Be Determined podcast, the podcast that follows up on topics from the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. I'm not Matt Farrell. I'm his much more intelligent and handsome older brother, <laughs> Sean Farrell. <laughs> and you forgot modest. <laughs> no, you're the modest one. <laughs> okay. Say hello, Matthew. Hello, Matthew. See, I knew you were going to say that. Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about Matt's most recent episode, which is exploring green building and the future of construction. There's no question marks in that one. No. This episode was from January 26, 2021. Before we get into the episode, Matt and I have some, we'll call it interesting news. There is now a way to directly support the podcast. You, if you are a regular viewer of Matt's YouTube channel. You, of course, know of the ways to support him there. And we've just implemented a way to support the podcast here. So if you check out stilltbd.fm, you'll see right in the middle of the page a support the podcast link. You can follow that and we would appreciate any support you're willing to give. We're starting off with two modest levels. One is a $5 monthly level and the other is just throw us a buck. It's like a yeah. tip jar. Yeah. <laughs> Think of us as the piano players at your favorite karaoke bar. Or your barista giving you your coffee. That's right. Just throw a buck in the jar. <laughs> so we'll be talking about green building and the future of construction. As one of your commenters pointed out, there's a fungus among us. Yes, there is. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and as I always like to follow up, that joke with, if you don't like it at first, it'll grow on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our mom would be so proud of us right now, Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere she's running around on tippy toes going, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> What's really fascinating to me about your video is that kind of thinking incorporated into new building structures really changes it from a there's a moderate level of impact when you're redesigning a building that already exists. Right. And I'm yep. really interested in some of these newer, very avant-garde looking buildings, especially the ones that incorporate, as you mentioned, fungus incorporated into the structure. And I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that. But also I love the visuals of some of the buildings that have plants and trees growing on the outside. Yeah. Uh, somebody said it reminded them of the movie Judge Dredd, that sort of, yeah, you know, that kind of future where that, that design, that aesthetic in sci-fi, I think has always been used to show here's a future where things are breaking down and nature is reclaiming the city. Mm -hmm. But now it's starting to look like, well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe that's not a dystopic <laughs> vision. Maybe that's actually the utopic vision, incorporating nature back into human use in that way so mm -hmm. that you avoid that sort of negative footprint and, and taking away from nature. So that's a preamble on my part of just saying, I think this is all pretty cool and it actually does have an impact on how you use a space and how a space feels. So I'll throw it back to you with a question about the fungus. Yes. yes. Can you talk a little bit more about how this, design approach began well well the, the fungus is it's still kind of in the research phases in many regards because it's i don't know how widely used it is yet but it's it what's kind of fascinating about the mycelium that they use to gr they basically grow these bricks it's st as strong or stronger than a typical brick but it's made from <laughs> fungus which is it makes my head hurt but mm -hmm. one of the areas of research was being is, is is still being done by nasa because when we colonize mars we're not exactly going to be taking concrete with us <laughs> we're going to build with whatever we have there could you imagine so, how inefficient <laughs> yes. how inefficient that launch would be right <laughs> It's not getting <laughs> like, off the ground like ladies some and guy gentlemen. With a, some guy with a clipboard <laughs> saying like you put what in the rocket or trying to land it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> land like a rock. Yeah. Um, but, but it's, 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 
you could take some of these spores and then start to grow it. And then you just have kind of this endless supply of a material that you can keep growing and making new bricks with combined with the materials that you have on Mars from like the sand and the dirt, and the rocks that are there. And you could start to produce massive amounts of this building material, which is an excellent in- insulator. It's extremely strong and it's repairable because like if you damage it, you can literally just kind of grow back in <laughs> the, new, the mm. new parts of it that you need. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that's being researched right now. I, I couldn't find actual products where it's actually being used like in a new building right, right now. But the thinking right now that they're looking at is using it as an insulator. So you'd have an exterior wall, whether it's a brick wall or something, and then you'd have basically a layer of this stuff. <laughs> and then you'd have your drywall and the stuff on the inside. Right. So it would end up acting as an insulator and you, you're you isolating it from the elements because it's sandwiched between two things. Right. So you don't have to worry about it biodegrading <laughs> because it is organic. So it, it could just live in the wall <laughs> as this living. It, it, this is where it, it this kind of stuff turns into science fiction for me is, yes. is that those, those yeah. bricks, it's just, okay. So this is something you literally grow your building. And when you don't need the building anymore, you basically just let it kind of rot <laughs> into a compost. Right. Heap. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't help but go into a kind of sci-fi horror place as you were talking about this and thinking about when it goes horribly wrong and the building just starts to eat the people inside. And then there was another part of me that would went into the, comedy realm with somebody saying, oh my God, there's a crack developing in the foundation. Quick, does anybody have athlete's foot or jock itch? (laughs) Gary, get over here. (laughs) Rub your foot on that crack. (laughs) Thank God for bad hygiene. (laughs) Oh God. Yeah. (laughs) It's, there's a number of, of unspokens in your video and in this entire engineering and architectural approach. Mm -hmm. And I think it's especially interesting to think about them given the pandemic and what the pandemic has done to what the pandemic has done to the way our culture is looking at work Mm -hmm. and at construction. There are across the country, there are massive corporations, retailers that are going out of business. There are large retail spaces, malls that are largely empty. Yep. Which creates a very large argument against new construction. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, those spaces are not necessarily designed in a way that would be easily retrofitted for green thinking or even easily repurposed to other uses other than retail. Mm Mm-hmm. At the same time, here in New York City, one of the biggest question marks that came out of the pandemic, it was not long after everybody being encouraged, work remotely, work from home if you can, in March. And then by May, there were places saying, oh, we've discovered that this doesn't impact our work at all. And there were certain companies that thought that having retail space, renting retail space in Midtown Manhattan was necessary for them to do their work, they were effectively ending their leases yeah, and turning into 100% remote work. And there has been a certain amount of concern within the building owners. Will rents actually start to drop? Will they have trouble filling these buildings? And how will, the imp- how will that impact how they use high rise space. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm just throwing this out there as it's an interesting thing. Did you give any thought into looking at how this wouldn't be in this video, but have you given any thought about the future of work and how much of our current assumptions about what work looks like would impact the kinds of buildings and the kind of energy usage that would be necessary if people stopped needing to go into offices and started doing things at home. Have you, have you ever given any con- consideration to looking at that and thinking about videos in that vein? I, I have. There was a, 
it's been on my backlog for a while, but I've been, I was looking during the pandemic, I was like doing research into like what the pandemic has shown us is possible <laughs> in yeah. the world to impact our, <clears throat> uh, effect on the climate because we're not driving around as much. Um, there's actually been a drop in CO2 output around the world during the pandemic. Um, it's kind of, sh this is not solving our climate change problem, but it's, it's, it's showing what could happen if we just make certain tweaks and adjustments to the way we live. Um, so I've been looking at that as a potential, uh, video idea, but the one thing that keeps coming back to me is for people like you and me and probably a lot of people that are listening to this, we can't get fall into a trap of, I work in an office. I don't have to go to an office. Um, this could change work forever, forever, for everybody. It's like, there's a humongous proportion of people that have to go to a physical location to do their job. Sure. And that will never change. People in construction or first responders or people that work in like supermarkets. It's like, there's always going to be a preponderance of work that requires mm -hmm. you to be in a location. So I don't think that this is going to have a dramatic impact on how we affect the environment and what buildings we have to build and all that kind of stuff. I, I The more I was looking into it, it's kind of like, okay, this is having a momentary blip on the radar, but I don't think it's going to be shifting us as dramatically as people think. For mm. people who work in offices and that is their job, it's going to have a dramatic impact. But that's a right. subset of all the people in the world. <laughs> so yeah. I think for people like yourself, I don't work in an office. I work from home now, but when I did work in an office, if I was still working there, my wife works in an office. It's like, this is going to forever change a lot of people's jobs where either they won't have to go into the office anymore at all, or they'll be going in three days a week and they can work from home two days a week. It's going to have a big impact on how offices are run, which is changes the dynamic of you don't have to build as big buildings. You don't have a company that yeah. have to lease, you know, a hundred thousand square foot of office space, they could lease 30,000 square feet and then have a rotating schedule of who comes in the office when, and their shared desks and shared spaces, um, which reduces their costs of keeping a space. Um, so it's like, it's going to save companies money. It's going to increase productivity. It's going to make for a happier workforce. It's going to make for a better work-life balance. It's going to, there's so many potentials, the potential things that it's going to improve, but it, it I, I'm still not sure if I'm going to make a video on it, but I've been looking into it. It seems like the sort of thing that could definitely be a recurring review on yeah. your part. Yeah. It could definitely be something where it's like you, you look into it July of this year and then July of next year, it's going to look potentially different. Things yeah. either will have returned more to the normal that we think of as 2019 style workforce. Um, or it may have evolved into a into a different place. I think I think what will be interesting will be. I absolutely recognize what you're saying about there's a huge portion of the workforce. It would be interesting for me to know what that portion is mm -hmm. that does absolutely have to show up to a certain place. And you know, you mentioned a couple of different fields. There are other places like doctors and nurses to a very large degree. There's a certain amount that can be done remotely, but doctors and nurses, a huge percentage of their, their work has to be done in a place with the patient. There's the meatpacking industry. One of the reasons they were so hard hit by the pandemic was because they had no choice. Those mm -hmm. people had to go into situations where they were working shoulder to shoulder because that's how meatpacking is done. Manufacturing jobs just across the board. It's like those yeah. will always need people in a factory building things or warehouses like Amazon warehouses. It's like malls are slowly dying here in the United States because online shopping is overtaking everything. And so, yes, there are malls that are going bankrupt and defunct and empty. But you know what Amazon's doing? They're buying, buying malls. old malls yeah. and turning them into warehouses for shipping. So it's like right. there are ways to recycle and change these things over and it's just we're shifting how we do things into different ways of doing things. It doesn't necessarily mean we're just going to have empty malls all over the country. Those malls may turn into warehouses. So it's it's an, we're right. we're in the middle of transition, which is going to be very painful <laughs> as we're going through it. But it's, it's trying to figure out where it's going to land. That's the trick. Turning to some of the comments, I think 
is a good way to continue this conversation. There's a number of comments from multiple users that brought up similar things. And I'll just read through a couple of them. Larry Cairns wrote, excellent summary. I suggest following with an episode on the passive house movement. Animal Facts wrote, have you done a similar video on net zero single family houses? <laughs> and then Demetrius Fragulis wrote, hello, Matt, great video. I'm an engineer and passive house consultants. Maybe you should do a video about passive house institute efforts <laughs> that are targeting the, targeting the household mainly and greater scale buildings. Keep up the good work. So those all seem to be uh, they're, they're, they're listeners <laughs> holding hands, holding hands while they all <laughs> responded to your video. I should have been more clear in my video when I was starting down this path of making this. Uh, I work with a researcher and he and I were going through all this stuff of what we were finding and compiling the stuff together. And it was like, okay, passive houses, the passive house, it's actually called passive house. Um, that movement was absolutely part of the original script but it was like there was so much to chew on mm -hmm. um i split it into two i said okay let's do one on just large structures like office buildings and let's do a separate video on just homes and so there is a passive house net zero home video coming we're wrapping it up right now um the script right now and then i'll be filming it soon so it'll be out in a few weeks but I should have mentioned that in this video and I completely didn't even think of doing that. I'm like, stay tuned because I'll be talking about passive houses. Um, I should have just done that. <laughs> so I've got, every one of those comments I saw popping up, I was like kicking myself of like, why didn't I mention that this was coming? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> dumb, dumb, dumb. So yeah, I'm definitely gonna be talking about that. Some of the other comments on the video include Andreas Kraus who wrote, this just brings up one important question. What the hell is an event center? <laughs> and I enjoyed that comment because as I was watching your video and you got to talking about the event center, I thought, oh yeah, events. Yeah. <laughs> I remember we when. used to go, we used to go places where we didn't know a lot of people and we would stand in places together. I miss those days. Yeah. Good times. Remember lines? You know what we need is we need that uh, Wayne's World. <laughs> we could, remember when? <laughs> Two more I'd like to share. Lavro Sipovac, which I have probably just slaughtered, <laughs> wrote, yep, definitely butchered it to the level that my ears started to bleed. I believe Lavro is referring to your yeah. pronunciation of the Norwegian, yep, it, it was the was it an energy research? Oh yeah, I I, I butchered I butchered the name. I just it, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I butcher. I, I I am like the classic American where it's like I took years of Spanish and I even studied a little bit of French and I don't remember a lick of it and I can't pronounce names that are from pretty much any other country around the world. So I struggle. Yeah. yeah. Believe me, I, I, my teenage son is currently studying French and at dinner I watch the, any French knowledge just fall out of his head while we eat dinner. Yes. He just sits there and it just like, blah, blah, blah. by the time he finishes and leaves the kitchen, he doesn't know anything about French. So you remember what I remember? Here's what I remember of Spanish. La Playa. The beach. Yeah. The beach. <laughs> La Playa. <laughs> <laughs> From my years of French, I remember Uelu Bibliothèque, which is where is the library? <laughs> Me llamo Mateo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's just a couple of Americans sending out some insults to our listeners around the world. Well, that's, that's us going, dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Final comment here from Mark Odin. And he wrote, pretty good overview, Matt. When I saw the title, I was thinking, here we go again, greenwashing. But you steered clear of many of the things you get LEED points for. I prefer the net zero concept since it's a bit more straightforward as far as lowering energy use or offsetting it with on-site generation. So I was curious, can you give us, this sounds like it'll be a sneak peek into the video you're talking about for, for home energy use. Mm -hmm. What the difference in his comment, what is the difference between LEED and net zero? Well, leads and then the BREAM or BREAM, I don't know how to pronounce it, that, that um, those standards, 
the lead standard has come under criticism because some of the things that they give you points for that make you leads platinum or leads gold, there's a lot of question marks around, does that really make a difference? Um, hmm. uh, so there's a lot of debate around how good those certifications actually are. Um, but when you take the leads platinum or leads standard kind of away and you look at what the, that they're doing, which is what I tried to focus on in the video, which is they're harvesting their own water. They're trying to generate their own electricity. They're doing better insulation, triple plane windows. They're doing all these things to try to reduce their energy usage, generate as much power as they can. And then the almighty dollar is always what it comes down to of this may cost you 10% more upfront to build the building, but over the life of the building, you're going to be saving millions of dollars over the 30 years. So it's, that's what I tried to focus on. Um, I'm going to be doing the same thing with passive house where the passive house was, uh, came out of Germany. Um, it's, it's, it's a similar thing, but on a very small scale. And it's a different uh, methodology about how you look at a house and you insulate it where you create a, um, uh, insulation envelope where typically when you build a house, you know, you dig a hole, you pour a concrete foundation and then you build the house on top of it. Well, think about all the heat and the energy that's getting lost through the concrete into the ground. So in a right. passive house structure, it's like literally you're like looking at everything. So it's like you're literally insulating underneath the concrete foundation to prevent heat loss to the, to the concrete into the ground. So it's like you're looking at every aspect of where you can cut losses down. And it's, it's kind of profound when you build a house this way. They do this in Canada actually a lot now. Um, which makes sense because it's so cold up in the most northern regions of Canada. But they build houses where you have this s complete seal. Um, they're airtight, which is obviously what you don't, <laughs> you need to breathe. <laughs> so you actually have to have these mechanical um, air exchangers that prevent heat loss from the inside to outside air, but it gives you fresh, clean air inside the house. There's all this kind of crazy stuff you do, and you end up with this home that basically you can power your home for like there's a house i was looking at recently here that costs 500 dollars a year to power 500 bucks and that includes hot water electricity that includes charging an electric car like every utility aspect of that home is costing them 500 dollars a year to heat and cool the home charge their cars it's 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 insane how efficient you can make a home when you look at it with the passive house st uh, methodology of how you build a house. Um, so it is, it's different with like a office building. You're not doing something exactly like that. It's going to be something di slightly different, which is the lead standard, but it, it, there, there's relations between the two, but there's different approaches of how you actually execute it. That all sounds very interesting. I'm looking forward to your future video about that. Yeah. Transitioning now to the second half of our show. As usual, we'll talk about some of the things we've been watching. And Matt, I'm flipping a coin. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> it's a game. I don't understand the rules, but let's go. <laughs> Do you want to call it? I'll call Tails. <laughs> it is heads. What does that so mean? So I win. Okay. That means I go first. Okay. I'm going to talk about a few things that have been shared previously in our uh, discussion about what we're watching and it's three quick hits from me. The first one is something you brought up very recently, which is in and of itself is the one man show of Derek Delgadio and it's directed by Frank Oz. And I will just mirror Matt's earlier comments, which were, it is impossible to describe what it is without giving away what it is which is kind of the point of what it is. Yes. You literally and don't so read anything about it. It's, it yeah. is go into it without watching any reviews or reading anything about it. Just go in and watch it. It is, uh, as a starting point, it is illusionist based and, but it is more than a magic act and it is autobiographical and it is, emotional and it is um it touches a lot of different 
buttons and it is very moving and it is very entertaining. And so I, I very strongly recommend it. I watched it last night. And as you said, Matt, uh, there were a couple of moments where I was like, well, I'm just going to start crying now. (laughs) Um, (laughs) there are, there are moments in various programs where I warn my girlfriend like, I just, I'm looking forward to watching this, but just to let you know, I'm going to be blubbering partway through it. And there were moments in this where I thought, well, I might not stop crying. Um, <laughs> it really hits you, like a ton, direct, it hits you like a ton of bricks. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it hits you like a ton of bricks. And it's not necessarily because of ongoing hard emotional truths. It is just because once a wound is opened, it doesn't necessarily close. Yeah. And you just know that that now that you know that that wound is there, it is hard to not know that the wound is there. Yeah. Uh, which again is part of the show. Yes. So I highly recommend it. Check that out. What did uh, your girlfriend think? What was her take? She thought it was really, she thought it was really great too. And I was, I actually thanked her for watching it with me. And she said, well, why I, she's like, my sister recommended it and I recommended it to you. And so like you would recommend it to me, her sister recommended it to her. And so we came together with both of us having had it recommended and I said, well, the main reason I'm saying thank you is because you tend not to like stuff like this. And there have been other magic shows, illusion, illusionist shows that I've watched. And I've watched them by myself because she hasn't had an interest. So this, right. this is different. This it, is not that. It's not a it magic not show. Just watching, it is not just watching somebody do magic. No. So I can't recommend it enough. It's so good. Yeah, really good. The other two things I wanted to recommend are two things which are not nearly in the same wheelhouse as in and of itself, but uh, the most recent epi- the most recent season, which is available on HBO Max, is not the current season. I believe it's last season, but it's Doctor Who, mm-hmm. which when I subscribed to HBO Max, was very happy to see that the full run of Doctor Who is available on it. And I keep going back to these episodes, despite the fact that I haven't liked very many of them this season. And it's because of Jodie Whittaker as the doctor. I want the show to get its feet underneath it enough that she gets a full chance Mm -hmm. to really demonstrate what she can do as the doctor, because I think she's as good as David Tennant. Mm -hmm. And I've been disappointed with some of the storytelling in this season where there have been a couple of episodes that literally felt like it was, Oh, we don't have a script. We'll go in there and get a couple of those Halloween masks and start running around and we'll just film it. We'll figure out what it is as we're going. And then there have been a couple of episodes (laughs) where they haven't reached the level of the best of tenant, but they have reached a level of, you can see where tenant is from where they're standing. Yeah. And I keep hoping, like, just keep planting those seeds. And there's been a couple of episodes where they have they have hinted at a longer story arc. And mm-hmm. I keep thinking, okay, as long as they, they, once they latch into that longer story arc, I think that they're going to get to good territory. But it's taking them a while to get there. But I'm being very patient with the show. So I recommend people check it out if they like Doctor Who. If they haven't seen Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor, there are some really great moments. And she's really carving out a place for herself as far as what doctor is she um there's been a in particular a couple of episodes one i watched last week uh i won't go too deep into the plot of it but it did finally have those moments of oh they're blowing the they're blowing the top off of something yes and i was very excited to see it so uh check out doctor who if you're into that kind of sci-fi And then at a completely different end of the spectrum is Dairy Girls, which is available on Netflix. It's a British sitcom, and it focuses on a group of students at an all-girls Catholic school in Ireland during the Troubles. This is set in the 80s. So this is when the IRA was in full swing and there were bombings and there were military operations by the British military. And these girls are growing up, growing up in Derry, which is rocked by many of these issues. And it is a darkly comic story. So it is this group of girls and one boy who is the only boy at the school. 
And the reason he's at the school is because he's English. And there was fear in the community that if this English boy went to the all boys Catholic school, he would get the living shit knocked out of him. So he is at the girls school instead. And it is in the same vein as it's always sunny in Philadelphia, but it's just with teenage girls. So yeah. it's got a kind of, it's always sunny vibe. It also has a train spotting vibe. Oh, wow. It's that kind of, there's this, there's a level of poverty. There's a level of, of danger in the community, but it's not, overwhelmingly in their face. It's just like they can't get to school because there's a bomb on the bridge. So the school bus takes two hours to get around the bomb on the bridge. And they're all just kind of growing up with that. Right. And so it's like, oh, that's, you know, like, why were you late to school again? Because there was a bomb on the bridge, mom. And it's that kind of like, well, then you should have walked. Like, <laughs> like what? It's not my fault that they put a bomb on the bridge. Yeah that kind of, of environment. So it, it, it reminds me a little bit of train spotting. It reminds me a little bit of it's always sunny. And I think it's a lot of fun and the performances on it are really just hands down, like brilliant. And the, if you want to get a sneak peek about the actors in the show themselves, there was from the most recent season of the great British baking show holiday edition. Yeah. They actually they had an there. episode <laughs> where they were on there. So yeah. That was my lead in to the Dairy Girls. We watched the Great British Baking Show and I was like, I like these people. So let's check out their show. So it's been a lot of fun. So check that out. Yeah, the um the Doctor Who mention that you gave, I mirror you pretty much identically. I watched that a few months ago. And I love Doctor Who. It's goofy. And there was a period where I kind of like started to kind of half watch it because it got started to get a little too goofy. Um, I like her a lot. Yeah, but I struggle to like the show and it's, yeah. it's for what you just said. It's, it's, they haven't found the right voice for the show. And there were episodes in this, that season you're talking about that I thought were awful, like yeah. almost unwatchable. And then there would be an episode where there'd be a segment of an episode that was brilliant. Like, yeah, you just retconned all of Dr. Who in a spectacular way. Oh my God, where's this going? So it's yeah. like, it, it, it's one of those, they're, they're flirting with greatness, but there was still too much of eye rolling. Wow, I could have written a better episode of my sleep. <laughs> kind yeah. Of, kind yeah. Of moments I had. Yeah, there was, I, to touch on two particular moments, there was an episode that I watched recently. And of course, because the entire season is available, you've probably finished the season, yeah. whereas I'm, a, I'm roughly halfway through it, I think. And I, there was an episode recently where it was a story element about uh, a spacefaring police force mm -hmm. locking down Earth and, and the doctor trying to figure out why. Yep. And there are a couple of character reveals during the episode that are mind blowing. Yes. And exciting from a big, like you just said, the retconning of the entire character and really kind of just like, oh my God, this could be amazing. What they're hinting that they might do. That episode was the one, I think it was the one I watched immediately after having watched one about a resort on oh, yeah, that the was planet yeah, that was with awful. toxic gas That's and awful. the resort is a <laughs> bubble community. It's so bad. <laughs> and it was so stupid. Yeah. And I turned to my girlfriend after we watched it and I said, this had so many stereotypical tropes in it where it was, okay, the plucky kid who gets into danger. Yeah. They had that in there. They had the mother and daughter who have to reconcile a bad relationship. Yep. They had that in there. They had the old couple who love each other desperately. And one of them has to sacrifice themselves to save the it was group. The, it was, the mad, it was the mad lib episode. It was like, okay, let's pull out the old, um, good old trope card and let's just yeah. fill in the blanks here and let's go make the show. <laughs> it was like, oh and it God. was, <laughs> and I said, if they had, if they had just focused on any one of those tropes, and said, everybody knows this is tropey. It's fine. We're just going to focus in and do the best job we can with this one trope. It might have been watchable. Instead, it was three shorthand versions of those tropes that were so easy, so clearly telegraphed. Yeah. 
that there was no tension about where any of them were going. It was like, oh, here's a plucky kid. He's going to be in danger by the end of the episode. Oh, here's this mother-daughter relationship. They'll have to iron that out by the end of the episode. Nothing was, there was no tension anywhere. And then the monsters on top of all of that, it was, the show is frustrating in the way that they will way too early reveal the creature. Mm-hmm of the episode, they do it consistently episode by episode. I'm always frustrated by how soon in an episode Dr. Who will be like, and here's a full clearly lit shot of a guy in a costume. Yeah. And this episode did that. If they had just maintained alien like levels of shadow and darkness and (laughs) jaws and (laughs) dripping saliva off of teeth, they could have maintained a level of monster tension that might've carried through. Instead, They had one five-minute sequence of that. And then by minute 15, they showed what was clearly a group of guys in rubber suits. Yeah. And then as if that wasn't bad enough, by the end of the episode, they were using CGI to turn those three guys into what looked like 3,000 of the same thing. So it was just 3,000 figures. It was like, oh, here's 3,000 guys wearing rubber suits. Yeah. Like, no, that's, that's, you know, like, and then the following week, it was like this mind-blowing, like, what? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give it time to develop because like you said, if you half watch it, fine. Yeah. But I'm just hopeful. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, get us to a point where the storytelling lives up to her performance. Cause she's so good. She's great. The two things I want to bring up are both from a United States perspective, foreign TV shows. Um, one is from Spain and the other one is from, uh, France and, uh, I think they're both on, no, wait, one's HBO and one is Netflix. And the one Netflix is the French show called Lupin, which is based on the gentleman thief character that's very famous around the world, except for here in the United States. Um, there's there's, there's <laughs> yeah. a Miyazaki film from the 70s that's a wonderful animated film about this character. And what's so great about this show is it's a twist because Lupin is a, fictional character from a book and that's what it is in this universe but this guy grew his father gave him a book one of the lupin books as a kid and his father uh gets framed for a crime and dies in jail and this kid basically leans into the lupin books and basically makes himself lupin so Mm. it's a modern show where he is essentially lupin doing amazing heists and crazy things and bringing him to life. And the main actor, I'm going to mispronounce his name probably, but it's Omar Sy. He is so good. He is so, so good. He's so watchable. He's charismatic. He's funny. If you like the the Ocean's Eleven's movies, you will like this show. It's kind of a cross between Ocean's Eleven and a thriller because Hmm. the overarching story between all the episodes is he's trying to figure out who framed his father and why. And, but yet within episodes, it's almost like a monster of the week. There are kind of in a bottle, like he has to pull off this heist to steal these diamonds and then he has to do something else. So it's kind of like each episode has a nice beginning, middle and end, but there's an overarching story of him trying to figure out who took his father. And like, it's, it's really really good compelling exciting television and it ended on one hell of a freaking cliffhanger which drove me (laughs) nuts um but this is this entire season is called part one so each episode is like part one episode one part one episode two so it's clearly there's going to be i don't know two or three parts um there's definitely more the way it ended (laughs) my guess is they've probably already filmed it and they're editing it but i cannot wait for this show to continue because it's it's just so much fun it's like he is spectacular i love this guy um mm-hmm. and i ha- i highly recommend listening to the original french dialogue and reading the um subtitles yeah i say this with every you know foreign language thing because you get the nuances of the actor's emotions which carries a lot of weight when you listen to the bad dubbing it's bad dubbing and it doesn't feel natural um the other show I want to bring up is one that's on HBO, HBO Max, and it comes from HBO Europe. And it's from Spain, and it's a show called 30 Coins. And it's directed by, I'm going to butcher his name, Alex de la Iglesia. 
Um, he's, I've never heard of him, but evidently he's kind of a cult horror filmmaker in Europe, uh, specifically Spain. This is, I think one of his first TV shows and it is, <laughs> it is bananas. It is absolutely insane. This guy is very unique in his style. It's not like it's not like he's emulating one filmmaker that clearly inspired him. He clearly has a lot of inspirations. There's elements of John Carpenter, the way he does things. There's elements of just a hint of Sam Raimi in there. There's there's um, uh, like 1980s horror films. Like there's a whole like I, I, I've, I've only two episodes in, but I'm getting this like Hellraiser vibe. And it comes mm. through the music because it's in most music in like modern shows that we see today, there tends to be a lot of drums and a lot of thrumming and things like that. The soundtrack in this show is, it sounds to me just like the Hellraiser soundtrack from the eighties, which was done by Christopher Young. It's a very, it's an orchestra. It's heavily melodramatic. Um, there's a lot of melodrama in the show and the horror is just, uh, it's, I don't know. I'm like, it's like spectacular. It's, it's, it's the show. <laughs> is it, is it creepy sounds and shadows moving or is no. it creatures? It, 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 you in the first 20 minutes, if you watch the, the first episode is an hour and a half. It feels like a film. The first half hour, maybe even 40 minutes, basically the first half, maybe third or so of the show. You think you know where it's going. You, you think you get a vibe. Of, oh, I, I get what the show's about. It goes off the rails. Like the show starts with, just to give you a sense, the show starts with a cow giving birth to a human baby. Okay. And the basic plot line of the 30 coins is the, the 30 coins that Judas got for betraying Jesus. Okay. And these coins are appear, are in the world. And wherever these coins are, crazy crap is going on. And right. so the show is focusing on this one town with this priest and the mayor and the veterinarian that delivered this human baby out of a cow. Um, it's, it's with these characters in this town who fa have one of these coins and there's just, it is, it, I, I don't want to give anything away, but <laughs> you, you think you, it's like, it sounds crazy. And it's like, you think it's kind of like an exorcist X files -y kind of show in the first yeah. 45 minutes. And then by the end, you're like, this is not the X-Files. This is not the Exorcist. There's elements of Stranger Things and like just bananas stuff. And it's not just a monster style show where there are monsters. It's psychological. It's, it's, there's a psychological aspect to what is happening to these characters of are these things they're seeing real or is it in their heads? Is this stuff really happening? Is it not? It's supernatural or is it not? It's like, there's a whole aspect of screwing with the viewer and kind of keeping you on edge as to what's happening. It is melodrama. It is melodrama. There are parts that happen in the show that kind of make you kind of go laugh. I don't know if it's intended to make you laugh, but it's like, I right. laughed like, Oh God, that was so melodramatic, but I'm really enjoying the show. And my wife was not watching it with me because she doesn't like to read subtitles. There was a scene in the second episode. Uh, I don't want to give anything away, but it involved somebody hurting themselves. And when they were threatening to hurt themselves, it's one of those, the tension of like, oh my God, oh my God, please don't do this. Don't do this. And then they actually do it and you're screaming and the special effects are way too good and way too realistic and you you keep yelling stop showing it stop doing this oh my god <laughs> make it stop in a good way it's not like a it's not unwatchable but it's it the show does a really good job of making you uncomfortable and playing with that discomfort and really kind of putting you on edge and keeping you off kilter it's i'm really enjoying it and it's i'm only two episodes in mm -hmm. i'm hoping it keeps up the entire run of the the show but I, I, if you like horror I'm movies, of, I'm reminded <laughs> of two things. I'm reminded of, of, um, you mentioned the melodrama and the first thing I flash back to were Vincent Price horror, like that kind of Gothic horror. Yeah. Um, well, and then another thing that I flash back to is you were just describing a scene where you're screaming at this, at the television, stop showing it, stop showing it was when you and I were little, and the movie The Howling was on in the middle of the afternoon. 
and there was the changing into a werewolf sequence yeah. where I was probably nine or 10 and you were six or seven and we were both sitting on the couch <laughs> with pillows in front of our faces <laughs> and I was looking at you and your pillow was on your lap and your eyes were as big as saucers and you were just staring at the TV and I was screaming at you, don't look, Matthew, don't look. And you said, I can't stop. I can't <laughs> stop. <laughs> and so I stood up and walked across the room with the pillow in front of me to get to the TV to change the channel. And once I reached the television and changed the channel, I clicked it twice and it turned out the howling was also on another channel being Broadcast, but it, was, but it was behind by a few minutes. But it was behind. So <laughs> as I clicked it, it went back to almost the same spot of the transformation. And I started to scream again and change the television again. Um, but seeing you, you know, yelling at you, don't look, don't look, and you screaming back, I can't stop. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning you now as an almost 50 year old man doing the same thing. Yeah. So. That's basically, that's basically what happened when I was watching it the other day. Yeah. So that sounds like a lot of fun. I will definitely check that out. Listeners should tell us what they think about this stuff. Do you have fungus growing in your walls? <laughs> or are you watching anything scary to the point where you can't turn away? And if you are, let us know what it is because I think both Matthew and I are in a <laughs> mental space where that's kind of what we want to see. Yes. <laughs> tell us what you think. You can find our contact information in the podcast description. Please do subscribe. And don't forget, we now have a way you can directly support the podcast. Once again, you can visit us at stilltbd.fm. And right there in the middle of the page, you will see a support the podcast link. And you can follow that. And it should not be very difficult. And we greatly appreciate all of our listeners. Whether or not you support us directly, we appreciate your tuning in and checking out what two brothers have to blather about. <laughs> yes, we do we would greatly appreciate any support anybody's willing to give. On top of that, you can give us a rating, you can give us a review, and you can share us with your friends. It really does help the podcast. The podcast helps the channel, the channel helps Matthew, and then Matthew can't help but stare at the screen. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening.